All right, so let's uh, let's talk about the Node HTTP uh, architecture, right? The, the server that we're going to be building uh, this um, in this module, right? So this is the overall architecture of what we are trying to build, right? We've been focusing most of our attention throughout the semester so far, right, on the client side of the client server architecture, right? Uh, this uh, client for us, right? It's a React JS application, basically a JavaScript application running instead of a browser, manipulating the DOM, right, to render its user interface. Uh, but, you know, this is just as well, it could, it could have been anything else, right? It could have been a, you know, it could have been a desktop application or games or, or some mobile application. Right? For us, it's a, it's a browser application, an application that runs inside of the browser using JavaScript. And you know, as long as this um, any one of these server implementation, any of these client implementations, as long as they can talk uh, using HTTP, right, they would be able to communicate with a server such as the one we're going to build today, right? Uh, yeah. So these these client applications are limited, right, in uh, the infrastructure that they are executing. <laughs> uh, but right with HTTP, right, we're going to be able to break out. From those limitations and delegate some of that work to a an outside process right that in our case is going to be an http server now there are many ways of implementing you know certainly there's plenty of gp server vendors out there you know jboss tomcat you know uh no js is just one right of many uh, infrastructures that allow you to create http servers Right. For different uh, different infrastructures, different languages, uh, you can build servers in any any of the uh, many different options. We're going to stick to Node.js since that's what we've been using so far, right? And we'll build it using JavaScript. But again, you, you could use Java, C Sharp, right, uh, Python. There's plenty of options. And here for the instance, right, it's it's all going to be Node.js, JavaScript everywhere. Right now, for your project, uh, you can choose to use a different infrastructure, right? If you want to explore C-sharp, right? Or Python and build servers there, that's fine. But for the for the assignment, right? If you uh, to this particular infrastructure. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about uh, building HTTP servers using Node.js. Uh, so yeah, so Node.js is a JavaScript runtime that uh, we've been using for the last couple of weeks. It's already installed, right? We've been using it to host our React.js web application, uh, but it can also uh, run applications uh, just from the command line. And um, and so when you install a Node.js, Node right, it installs a couple of executables, of which we have been using a couple of them, right? For instance, npm, npx, right? Those are uh, Node executables when you install Node.js, Node right? But there's another uh, executable that uh, we haven't looked at, right? Which is the Node executable, right? Node allows you to run JavaScript applications right from the console, right? Right now, right, when we think of JavaScript, we always think about, you know, oh, it's the programming language of the web, right? And usually we think about it as running exclusively um, in the browser. But it's not so, right? JavaScript in the, you know, late 2008, nine, right? Uh, allowed us to, now execute JavaScript outside of the browser, right? It's able to interpret JavaScript, right? And just run it like any other programming language, right? But from the from the console. Now, obviously, because it's running outside of the uh, browser, uh, you no longer have access to interact with the browser, <clears throat> right? You, can, you don't, you don't have buttons. You don't, you don't have the DOM. There's no DOM, uh, control, right? So none of that uh, is, uh, is available when you run JavaScript programs outside of the browser. Right, uh, but uh, even though you have you you lose uh, that 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 capability, you don't have a user interface. Uh, nevertheless, right, you can do a whole bunch of other things, right, that you couldn't do before. Since you can run it from the from the command line, you know, inside of your operating system, you'll have access to the file system. You have access to connecting to a database, right, um, connecting to a network, and and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to you know from the console, we're going to build a server that can listen for incoming requests, right. Uh, from the client, our client, our React.js client, right? And then 
you know, uh, try to fulfill those requests by, by the file, inserting something in the database, looking something up in the in the in the network from the internet, from the web, right, and then re responding to the uh, React JS client. Um, so to, to create a Node.js project is very simple. Right? At the command line, you know, you can create a directory, right, and then just initialize the directory as the as a Node.js project just by using npm init, right? Very simple. We'll demo this a little later. It'll ask you a whole bunch of stuff. Right, uh, you can just keep the defaults. Now, now uh, from now that you, we have a project, right, you can create a JavaScript file, say hello.js, right, and and in there you can use commands that uh, should be familiar to you, right, that we might have used uh, a bit in on the client side, right, console.log, and then you, you can spit out something in the prompt. Now, this, if you run this in the browser. You know, it would it would display in your web development tools, right? In the console, here we don't have web. There is no web, right? Um, it, this would be running right in the console, so it would spit out on the console. You know, no hello JS. It would spit out right out. You know, hello hello world, right? Uh, now the so we could build all sorts of things uh, with uh, Node.js, right, and JavaScript, but you know, let's let's get back to where we are. We are building an application right, with our user interface, yes? Uh, so to do that, we need to create an HTTP server, right? It's you know, the only way that the that the browser application, the React.js um, app, uh, application running on the browser, the, the only way that it can talk to anyone, right, is by sending it through the network. So we're gonna, we're gonna create a server using the Express Library uh, so that uh, we can listen for those incoming requests from the uh, the browser. So we'll do npm install express, and I guess I can I can demo this. I can uh, go to a terminal. Uh, so let's see uh, where are where are we? Where are um, let's go to twenty twenty four and uh, summer. And um, so yeah, so we created we created this um, this project right, for us a, to create the user interface part of the our client server application so let's create another directory where we're going to build the server side right of our client side application right so i'm going to use the same name i'm going to say i'm going to create a directory canvas well it's not a react web application it's going to be a node uh, server right, app and it's going to be for summer one 2024 and let's go in there And it's empty, and as the instructions say, we're going to do npm init. The npm init is going to initialize this as a Node.js project, right? And so by default, it takes the name of this application as the name of the project, which is good. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just going to change all the defaults. What it does is that it creates for us a package.json file. There it is, right? And, and that package.json file has all the configurations of our project so far. We can take a look at it, of what it looks like right now. There it is, it's a JSON file, uh, where you could type in who the author is, right? If there's a, if there's a GitHub repository, you could put it in here, right? Um, also, the importance of this file is that it lists all the dependencies that this project might have with other projects, right? Or other libraries, right? That um, need to be installed for our project to run. Uh, so let's uh, let's continue. So one of those libraries that are of interest to us is the Express Library. Right? So let's uh, install it. So this is going to allow us to create a um, an HTTP uh, server. Right? So we'll do npm install. You know, just like we install things on our React, 
web application here too. We are going to install uh, JavaScript libraries, right? But in our Node.js server application. Right? So npm install express. So that that uh, installs it, and if you look at the package again, right, you'll notice that now there's a dependency section, right, that says that our project, our Node.js application, depends on this library being installed. Otherwise, our code is not going to be able to run, right? And this is important, right, because when you, you know, if if you put this on GitHub and anybody wants to use your project, right they would have to do an install and it would install all the libraries that are dependent, right? Same thing when you deploy this on a um, AWS or render.com or Heroku or whatever, right? The, the, uh, those infrastructures know from, right, what are the dependencies and they would install those libraries so that it could run not only locally, but it could run remotely. So this file is very important, right? Uh, so we have that. And so now we can, we can create a, um, a little hello world, you know, HTTP server, right? So let's, um, let's uh, use code, right? Let's uh, create a new window and we'll open up that, um, that directory we just created, right? So we'll say open folder and we'll go to 2004 summer, and this is the one we just created. So we're gonna open it up and we can see the package JSON, right? That we were just looking at, right? So it's the same file. Uh, so let's uh, create a little um, server, right? That can respond, hello, hello world, right? Let me uh, put this here. And we'll create it in a file called app.js. So, so just like, Js our web, um, web application, right? Which we called it app.js, um, and it's the entry point of our user interface application. Here, also, we need to have an entry point, and I'm going to use the same name. It doesn't have to be the same name, right? But I'm going to use the same name to understand that this is the entry point of our uh, app, uh, application, our server application, right? So we'll create here app.js right? and it could just be a, a, a hello right so this would be console log hello world right and and then from the command line you can see the we can see the app.js there we can just run it from the command line like that right and just comes back and says hello world right ever to get right so anyway so a little more interesting so what we're going to do is that uh, we're going to um, load the express library. Now, notice that I'm using this keyword require, right? So this is a, a an older syntax right, for being able to import libraries, right? And then when we got to ES6, Right. Uh, the uh, there was a more modern syntax that was created right, that uses the import keyword. Right. But by default, Node.js doesn't understand ES6 by default. Right. So this is the native syntax that it understands. So let's let's do this like this for now. We'll come back in a minute. Right. And we'll re re um we'll reconfigure it so that we'll be able to use ES6 just like we have been doing in uh, uh, so far. Right. But uh, let's uh, let's use this older syntax. Some documentation or examples that you might find out there in uh, Stack Overflow or several other places, they still use this older syntax. So it's good that you see it, become familiar with it, right? But never use it, right? Um, yeah. So stick to the newer. Uh, but I just want you uh, to see it for a few minutes and just just so you're aware of its existence. Uh, so yeah, Express, then we instantiate an instance of the Express library, right? And so now the Express library allows us to uh, respond to requests, HTTP requests, right? And the and browsers, that's Wikipedia, or you go to any, any website, 
right? Uh, that's that's all browsers do, right? They send HTTP requests all to these servers, right? So we're building here from scratch an HTTP server, right? So the server might say, and there it is. Uh, so here's a, the simplest of hello worlds, right? Uh, so no, notice that I haven't run this yet, right? If I if I go with my with my browser, let's say new. So here here's my little browser, and I go to a. Uh, I'm going to have the server running for four thousand. Uh, if you remember our our web application is running on port 3000, right? Notice that ours is running at localhost 3000. So I'm gonna run my server, right? And a different port, it can't be the same port, right? Because it'll, right, it'll collide and says, oh, that port is taken. I can't listen to the same port, right? Uh, so I'll run it in a different port uh, on port 4000. Now, right now there's nothing running on port 4000. There's something running on port 3000 Right, my React web app, there it is, right? And it's responding my content with, that we are so familiar. So nobody's listening at port 4,000 though, right? So if I go to 4,000, there's no one there, right? So the browser says, I made a network connection. I try communicating with running at port 4,000, nobody's listening there. So let's create something that can listen to that incoming request, right? So I'm gonna say that um, this says that the, you know, if the um, if the um, if the root of the request has this pattern, right? If you receive a request as a GET request, right? Uh, so HTTP servers can receive a, a, any number of different types of requests, right? One of the most common types of requests are GET requests to retrieve data. Uh, so, for instance. Right. If I if I go with my browser and I go to say, um, I can I can if I open my up my inspector right and I uh, if I if I open up the network tab, right. The the network tab. This is going to show uh, all the. Disable uh, cache. All requests are going to go out. And I say if I, if I type here, HTTP colon slash slash Wikipedia, okay, you can see these are all the requests that the server that the client, the browser, has made to the Wikipedia server. If you open it up, it gives you the response how the server responded, right? And the headers, you can see the URL that went out to that server, you'll see that the method that was used is the get method, right? Uh, if you look at all these, these are all get, get, these are all get, 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 getting everything, the images, everything, okay? So most of the requests that leave the browser, right, unaltered by default, right, are all get requests, right? So we can create our server on our, our end, our, you know, our particular server, we can say, okay, well, if there's an incoming GET request, right, uh, and we can also put here uh, a URL, right? So, so here, the um, the URL here is the slash. See the slash at the end, okay, which is the root, right, of the the base of the of the domain. Uh, but if you look for something else, you know. Starship, uh, SpaceX. Uh, now the URL is different, right? It's a slash wiki slash something something something. So it's the root. Yeah. So this is the domain. Uh, then does that that is the root of the uh, context, right? Of uh, of the base URL, right? and then whole bunch of routes, right? These are paths that are mapped to either physical documents, HTML documents, or dynamically generated on the fly, right? And so, so we can tell our something similar. We can tell our server, well, if the, if that, if the URL looks like this, right? 
you know, not considering the domain, right? Local host, 4,000, we're already here, right? Uh, so after after the, the first slash, right? We can then create routes to pattern match what is the request. So here we're saying that if the request comes in a slash hello, uh, what's gonna happen here is that I'm providing a function that can handle that request, right? It will run this function if the server receives a request of type get, a get method request, right? and the URL matches slash hello. Right? Uh, and, um, and so what's gonna happen is that the, ser this, uh, the server is gonna run this function. And, and that function, Notice it's a it's declared as an arrow function. It doesn't need to be an arrow function. It could be a regular function, right? But we do see that it, it has two arguments, right? And those two arguments are, you know, declared in that specific order, right? And the two variables are req and res, right? Now the names of those variables doesn't matter. Right? Position matters. The first one here uh, represents the incoming request. And one represents the outgoing response, right? And and so so what this allows us to do is to participate in the requests and then response back to the to the client, right? There's a, it's a cycle. The client sends the request, and the server does some computation, some calculations, right? Does some work, right? and then it generates a response back to the client, right? So that's a basic interaction between a client server application right so in our case we are ignoring the request right we'll see a little later how to how to use the request. and we're only using the response to send back a response right send back a response using the response dot send right? we're just sending a simple string greeting right the incoming uh request okay uh, so once we have that, we can then uh, start listening at a particular port, right? In our case, we're going to be listening at 4,000, right? 3,000 is a very popular port in, amongst JavaScript developers, right? But it's already taken, right? The React web application in my machine is already running at port 3,000, so that's taken. So I'm using port 4,000. It's also very popular. That's it. This is the, the simplest, you know, hello world. You know, HTTP server you could possibly think of. So from the command line, right, I can run this. You know, node app.js is the same, the same code we ran earlier that said hello world. So there it is. So notice now it's kind of like stuck there. See that it didn't immediately complete, right? It didn't respond or anything. So it's stuck forever, right? Listening at port four thousand for an incoming request that matches slash hello, right? So, so let's try it out. Let's uh, go back here. And so this was the request, right? So we'll inspect and we can see the network. And so localhost 4000, notice, but before it said, this site can't be reached. No, basically the browser is saying, hey, I sent this request. The, there was no connection. I could not establish a connection with anyone. Uh, so let's refresh. Now this time is a little, a little different. Right, a little different. So right now, instead, we didn't get a an error to that uh, we were denied communication. There was communication. Right? It went out to the server, this, and, and, the, and the but the server said, "Okay, well, um, whatever you were looking for, I could not find it." Right? So what it did, it was trying to pattern match this slash, right, the root, but there's nothing mapped to the root. Right, so it didn't know how to respond. So it said, I can't find what you're looking for, right? But we did we did create another route right, that said that there was a hello there, right? In this case, it did find it, right? And there it is. Um, it responded with a status code of 2,200, means okay, means, yep, I did find it. So 404 means I couldn't find it. 200 means everything's okay, right? And indeed, you can look at the response that comes back from the server. It's just this plain text, uh, hello world, right? That the browser over here is rendering uh, with uh, with the text, hello world. That makes sense? Yeah, so that's, that is the most trivial 
right, HTTP server uh, we can think of, right? And um, and you know, so we'll build on this. Uh, and what we're trying to do is is have this the server running, right? And the client, our React application client, uh, is going to be sending requests to this server for it to offload some of its responsibilities, saying you know things that the client can't do, you know, like saving things to a file, remembering things, right? Saving it to a database, things like that. Everybody good? Make sense? All right. Okay. So let's uh, let's stop the server. Let's stop the server. Um. Yeah. Uh, so it's also very common that um, you know, as you're running, as you're developing. Um, Every time you change a something uh, in, the, in the file, right? Ideally, the um, the server would recompile, rerun. You know, we're kind of used to that when we are implementing our React web application. That you know, we change something on the file, right? And then it immediately is available. We can browser, right? And our changes are available immediately. Here on the server, is slightly different, right? There's really nothing uh, that is being compiled. Uh, and uh, it, so, so the only thing really that, that we can we can achieve that same kind of behavior is to just restart the server. I notice that if I if I start the server right, and um, and I say hello, notice that I have a I have that response. Now, if I make these changes and say you know hello world, whatever, right? If I change add a couple of exclamations. If I go back and I refresh, notice that those changes are not taking right. Uh, the only the only way to make that change permanent, I, you know, for it to see those changes, is that I would have to stop the server and restart the server, go back and and refresh, and notice that those changes now take place. But that's very very inconvenient to have to stop, restart, stop, restart. So instead, uh, we're going to use NodeMon. Right? NodeMon is a little tool that is going to watch the files if they changed. Right, in this folder, right, it's going to automatically restart the uh, server. Right, so the assignment asks you how to install NodeMon. NodeMon app.js. Right, so now, now it's the same thing. It's running the server. It's working the same way. There it is. It's working. Right, but now, right, if I make changes, right, so I say, um, you know. Life is good, right? I save that. Uh, notice that restarted. See that node must say that it restarted because there were changes, right? So I stopped the server and restarted the server. So if I go back and I refresh, notice that without me having to do anything, the changes take effect. Yeah. All right. All right. So the the um, very good. Now. Um, we want to be able to integrate right, the server with the client, with the browser, uh, with the React.js uh, browser client. So, so first we're going to integrate it, uh, you know, doing some really, really simple things. Right? Um, and then we'll get, get through some more advanced uh, ways of integrating the client and the server. Right? So let's, let's take a look at it. Right? One of the simplest ways right, is to um, you know, go back to our, oh, first of all, so right now we're using the require syntax, right, to load the express. Uh, but, um, so that's an older syntax. Let's, uh, let's, let's reconfigure our server to use the more modern ES6 import statement, right? So let's do that. Uh, so to do that, uh, we can do the package JSON, right? And, tell our application to use the more modern syntax, right? And we can do that by changing the, the type. You can say the type of this application, and notice it gives us two options, right? So CommonJS is the default. That is the syntax that we are require. That's a CommonJS syntax, but we wanna use the more modern ES6 syntax, which is the module option here, right? So let's choose that, we'll save. Uh, now, if these, I don't know if the server tried to restart. So notice that the server crashed, right? 
it summed the change in the file, it the server, restarted the server, but now it's a, uh, it doesn't understand the require anymore, right? So it says a require, that's not in the new module ES6 syntax, right? Maybe you meant import, right? And so that's what we're gonna do, right? So we're gonna go back and, and go back to app.js and we're gonna rewrite this using the new syntax, say uh, import, express from like that right so now it restarted right and notice that now it successfully restarted it didn't crash anymore right? so this should be able to just work just the, just the same way notice that it still works just fine. okay everybody good all right so let's take a look at uh, how is it that we can integrate this uh, with the with the client uh, although let's see prior probably the slides uh, go through that a little bit uh, so we did the hello world oh es6 we did type module hello world oh here we also um mapped the the root of the uh of the request notice that uh, right now right if we uh try to access the root notice that there's nothing mapped to that uh, there's the slash there's nothing at the slash Oop. there's something at hello but nothing at the slash uh, so let's, um, we can add something here. We can say, you know, we can map something to the root, just like that, right? And then uh, request, uh, respond with, um, you know, I don't know, welcome to web development, right? So, that should have restarted there it is so every time i save it restarts the server so now this is mapped to something it should not it should not complain saying that there's not no 404 if i refresh now it did find it welcome to web development the root okay uh these are these are uh um it's important that you you build these routes right that that, that map to the root it's a very simple it's a very quick way to you know, check to see if your server is running, right? And you know, when you start deploying these to the remote servers, you know, you want to be able to see that, you know, at least it's responding, you know, hello, well, you know, welcome, right? Uh, the, you know, at the root, uh, before you even get into the more complex uh, process of, you know, retrieving data, interacting, adding, removing, updating data, you know, is it even running, right? So this is a nice little test. And so, so um, yeah, so we're going to be creating, we're going to be learning right today about, you know, how we design these routes, what can we do with them, right? how can we expose these and make it available to the, to our web application? How do we integrate, you know, the, all this job that we can do now here? Uh, so. So we're going to have you know several dozens right, of these you know of configuring the server to respond right to to the client this way right and right now we you we're doing it our client is just a simple browser right it's just a browser it's not even not even our react application who's interacting with the server it's just us directly interacting with the server through a browser right, right? so we'll, we'll get to the react in a minute uh, but I did want to point out is that you know we'll have lot lots of these right, and we call these routes right. So that this is you know we are declaring a route. Very similar to in the user interface, right? We um we use routes a router, right, and and that uh, using the um, um React router, and, and the way we did that is that we used a, a route tag and said that. If the path looks like this, then show this content. Yes. Well, this is similar in that you know the server is listening to the incoming routes or these paths, uh, but instead here we are executing a piece of code. Right? We're running this, we're calling this code uh, so that it can respond back to the data. The browser, it was we were calling a function, right? Uh, we had the route, and then we get the component. The component is just a function. The function would run, and it would respond right, with a, uh, DOM manipulations, right? That would render something in the user interface, right? Here, we're not manipulating any DOM, right? There is no 
user interface to speak of, right? But we do, we still have a function. Right? It is computing something, right? And right now it is responding with a plain text. Yes. Uh, eventually it's going to respond with data structures, right? What we're going to do is that, you know, all those data structures that we have in the browser, right? Courses.json, modules.json, assignments.json, right? All that, we need to move it to the server side, right? That can't live on the client, right? Because we can it and we can uh, do some really simple manipulations, uh, temporary manipulations, but there's no way for us to perform changes to it, right? Uh, so for that, needs to, all that needs to be moved here uh, on the server, right, to manipulate this data structure. Uh, so anyway, uh, this, there's going to be a lot of routes, right? One to create a course, one to delete a course, update a course, right? And it's going to be several dozen. So we need to learn how to break out this into smaller pieces, right? So for instance, let's let's break this out into a separate function, right? A separate file, right? And let's learn how do we then import that back in here. And so I'm going to remove that from here. Right now, if I try to refresh, right, it's not there. Uh, so I'm going to create here a little a file I'll call hello dot js and i'll paste in those two files those two functions right um so one thing that i'm missing in this function is a reference to app right so what, we, what we're not going to do is to create that instance like we did here instead this is the only instance that we'll ever create of the express lever and we'll just pass it around right so i'll need to pass it around in here somehow right uh, so what we'll do is that we'll wrap this inside of a function right and um so we'll call that function um hello right so this is a function right and then we'll export this export function right uh, and then we'll uh, receive here a reference to the to the app so we're going we're to instantiate this function we'll pass it an instance of the app from our app.js right and so that I, we can share it share it around right uh, so in here we can now import. So we can import hello from hello. Now careful here, right? The our React web, um, the the extension of the files that were, was being imported was optional. You didn't have to. Actually, I think our IDEs uh, frown upon us, right? If we try to add the extension, here we do have to add the extension, right? We have to say hello. That right. So now that we have a reference to that function, we can just call it here, right? So it needs to be done. The import needs to be done before the express, right? And then the calling, you know, passing a reference to app needs to be done after we have an instance of app, right? Uh, so now it should work again. It's working again. Everybody good? Yeah. So we're going to do that uh, several times, right? In 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 particular, we're going to. Uh, uh, Create one for our lab five. We're going to do a lot of exercises, uh, you know, to learn how to integrate the browser and the and the, the server. Uh, so, so let's create a um, a function right for lab five, right, and on the server uh, where we're going to implement, we're going to learn and practice. You know, what what are the different things that you can do on the server? So let's do that. So let's uh, create here a new file. We'll call it. Uh, actually, we'll we'll create a, a directory, a whole directory, lab five, lab five, and in there we'll create a function in here. Excuse me. We'll do we'll do uh, export uh, default function. Ah, hello. This lab five. that we have that and um, create a route in here that if you get lab five right we're going to respond lab five is good <laughs> okay or something simple you know welcome to lab five right and then so from app.js we're going to import that lab five right and so we're going to pass in a reference to app like that right so now we should be able to say you know 
HTTP localhost like that, slash lat5, and this should come to the file. Right. So let's try it out. So we can say um, now slash lat5. And it comes back with welcome to lat5. Everybody good? All right. Um, okay. So let's, um, let's now try to communicate to this new route running on the server, but from a client. Uh, the way we have been communicating is by literally right, at the browser typing this URL, but I don't want to do this manually. I want to be able to do this programmatically right, from our React web app. I want to be able to have the React web app come in here and send a request to the server and then grab the response and do something with it from the user interface. Right? So let's practice that. So, so to do that, uh, let's create a lap five component right, on the user interface. Right? And from there, right, we'll try to communicate with uh, this uh, brand new route that we've created on the uh, server. Right? So let's, um, uh, so here's my, my React web app. Right? So we'll create a lap five component. So on the source labs, so it's lap four. Let's create a file under lap five. So we'll say lap five index.tsx. Right, so this is on the user interface, right? So again, there's a function lap five in the server, and there is a lap five function here on the React.js, right? And we want them to be able to talk to one another. One is running uh, in the React to be server, right? And we want to be able to for him to communicate, right? And again, the browser could be right running halfway across the world on the you know on the west coast somewhere, right? Uh, and the server can be running somewhere in Eastern Europe, right? And nevertheless, uh, they're going to be able to communicate right now on an online machine, right? They're run, both running locally, right? But in theory, right, they're all going to be uh, and in and um. And literally, right, they are going to be running, you know, not co geographically co-located, right? They're going to be world apart. Right? So let's create a, a lab five component here. So this will be uh, export uh, default function lab five. Okay. Uh, and what we're going to do is that uh, let's create a hyperlink so that we can communicate with the uh, URL that we just created, the href. And it's uh, localhost 4000, right? And it's lab five. And this is uh, go to lab five. There we go. And then from, from um, our um, table of content, we have a lab five in the table of content. I forget. Labs. Okay, we don't have anything for lab five in the table of content. So let's add a table of content here. And let's see. So it'll be uh, lab four. So so this is five, 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 and five. Let's save that. So there's five lab five. So we go lab five there. Uh, I think we need to create a wrap for it. Uh, in here, right? Lab five. This would be lap five and lap five. Oops, uh, lap five. Oh, I need to import it. Oh. What the? Import lap five. There we go. Go to lap five. Uh, and so if I click on it, if I click on it, notice that it goes and says, Welcome to lap five. That makes sense? So now this is a very rudimentary way of interacting and integrating, right? The only thing that I've done 
uh, is that um, I've just created a hyperlink, right? Uh, a more interesting way of tracking will be to send a request, but stay in the user interface, right? We don't know how to do that just yet, right? We'll know in a minute. Uh, but right now, the only way to interact is, is that we're clicking on a hyperlink and we are navigating away from our React application. We're logging the React application. See that? Now we're interacting directly with the server and the server is responding. This is just as if I would have just typed this, right, from the URL at the browser. I would have gotten the same response. See that? Right? Uh, so there's there's no real need for the user interface. As long as I have the URL, I can communicate. That's fine, right? So we don't have to do that just yet, right? Uh, we'll learn in a minute uh, how can we you know, send the request, but actually don't leave the user interface. Stay within the user interface, right? intercept the request, right? and then continue working. Okay. Uh, so, so um, uh, let's uh, clean this up a little bit. Uh, this uh, five fish. Why can I not uh, class name this container at least? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so later on we'll learn how to interact uh, with the low uh, lab five, but without leaving the the um, uh, the user interface. Everybody good? You're still with me? All right. All right. Um. Yeah. See, uh, what else we got? Path parameters. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with the uh, with the assignments, right? Uh, since we're gonna get into several of those uh, exercises, so let's take a look at it and you know and, to, to, and introduce the assignment. Now. And, uh, we've been um, already starting to implement some of the exercises there and going through some of the skills, right? So let me do that. Uh, let's see, do I have it here? Yeah, here's assignment five. Right now, some of you have already started on it. And um, uh, first, you'll get some uh, some history on, on on the client server applications and, and using server types of different servers and you know, how to install Node.js, which you should already have Node.js. Um, I think this is a, not the latest version of Node. You can go in and install the latest one. You might already have the latest one. You don't need it. You don't need the latest, latest. Uh, then this walks you through creating the node uh, server application. We've done already. We initialized it. We created a simple hello world, right? We um, uh, we used Express. We configured a node mon. This tells you how to install node mon. We did a couple of hello, you know, hello world uh, uh, routes, right? We configured to have ES6. Uh, and then we moved it to a separate uh, hello uh, function, right? And then we created a, a lab, lab five, uh, that we were able to uh, communicate, right? By clicking the URL. That makes sense? Right, okay, so here we are. Um, so right now, the, our, uh, our user interface, Right, is directly sending the request out to the server, which is fine. It's working fine. Uh, now, now eventually, right, this React application will be running on Netlify. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the server will be running, you know, maybe on Render.com or Heroku or AWS. So certainly the URL is not going to be localhost 4000, okay? Um, so, so we need to, we need to somehow make our code independent on where is this server actually running, right? Because locally we do want it to talk to our local server, but when we deployed on Netlify, we wanted to talk to the remote server that is running on AWS, right? And so instead of hard coding this here in the in, Re, in the React uh, um, component, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna create an environment variable right, that uh, is gonna hold the actual URL, right? So that we can then configure it to be different, 
so that locally it is localhost. But when you when it's running on Netlify, it'll use Netlify's environment variable, right? And then it'll know that it should communicate with something else, right? Running on render.com or Heroku or whatever. Um, so let's do that. Let's uh, create a, an environment variable. Now you can configure environment variables in different ways, right? And um, so on Windows, you, you know, there's a dialog that you can pop up and, and create your environment variables. And you know, if you your uh, your server, it would pick up those environment variables, right? Uh, on Mac, right, you can you know de declare environment variables in your bash file, right? A bash profile, and uh, or you can also declare them here inside of your um, project, right? Uh, so, and you do that inside of an env file. Dot env. Right. And then inside of that, in the env file, you can you can create various um, variables, environment variables. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, you can you can create different depending on what environment are you running this on, right? If you're running it locally, or if you're running it in production, or in a test, you know, like in a QA environment, right, or, or um, performance environment. Either run in a local environment, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna use the dot local, right? So these are all semi-standard uh, names for these files. You know, this one this tells that this is an environment variable, right? Uh, that these environments are there all in the local environment that should not be used when you're running on a production environment, right? Uh, but which is fine, right? We are running in our local environment. Okay. So so what we're gonna do is here is we're gonna create a variable. Uh, and I believe, um, yeah, this is going to be called like that. All right, so let's paste that in there. Uh, so there it is. So we have we have declared a an environment variable called React Remote Server, right, which has the URL right of where our server is actually running. Now, locally on our machine, it has it, it knows that right that's where our server is running. Now, when this is deployed on Netlify. This environment variable will have a different value, right? It'll point to something in um, Heroku or Render, okay? Uh, so this one is okay for now, right? That's good. Uh, when we deploy later, a Netlify will change this, right? So that it points some, somewhere different. Um, so let's uh, let's revisit this. Uh, and so instead of using this hard-coded value, Right, we're going to load that variable we just declared. Okay. Uh, so first of all, environment variables in React, right, so that you can read them from within your React application, they all have to start with this. You have to prepend that that uh, token, you know, React underscore app underscore, right, and then another variable, right. Uh, and now, now this, if you restart the the, if, if you restart our React server, let's restart it. Notice that it, this doesn't take effect until you actually restart the server, right? Now it reads the environment variables and now they're they're available to us, right? From within our, from within our application as follows. You can say, um, const load the remote um, server, right? It's, uh, it's available in process process dot react app remote server there it is right uh, so this so this value this variable is this variable right there right and it's available through a global a global a global object called process process has an environment property which has environment variables okay uh, and one of them is this one that we've just added okay uh, and so what this is saying is that uh, if this is a, a, this or here right it's kind of like a safety is that if it's not declared if it doesn't exist then default to localhost 4000 if it's not there right but to prove that this is actually working i'm just going to comment that out and make sure that this works right uh, so um, 
and we should just be able to print this out. Uh, so HR, uh, and we should be able to print it out. So environment variable, environment variable, and we can just run and display hello. There it is, see that? Localhost 4000. So we were able to read right, the value right, and then display it here. So now everywhere, uh, instead of using this hard-coded reference to the server, right, we're gonna use this variable instead. Right? Uh, so we're gonna convert this into an expression, right? And this is gonna be a, um, a string expression. Now this right here is going to be the expression remote server. Yes. And so now this should still work. If I click on it, this still works, you know, even though it's using this variable. Now the name of the variable, well, constant here, doesn't matter. It could be whatever you want. You know, um, I call the remote server, but you can call it whatever you want. But um, it is, it does need to reference that React app, you know, remote server environment variable. Everybody good? Yes. So anyway, so um, you know, we do have a little exercise here for you to practice this, right? I called it the exercise as environment variables, and it's just only displaying that one environment variable, right? Uh, so do that, create it. I load it into your lab five, make sure that it works. So there it is. So environment variables, displaying it, right? And then, um, and then I use it to override, right? The hard coded, and I, you know, build a, uh, a URL from that string. All right. Okay. Now on the server also needs to be configured so that, you know, when it runs on, on, on the remote server, right, on the remote environment, it needs to, to be able to handle that. So to do that, on the server side, also, right, this app.js, we're saying, we're listening to port 4000 here. And locally, we can control all the ports. We know that, you know, React Web App is running on port 3000, and on the server, we're running 4000, that's fine. Uh, but when this runs on the remote environment, we don't know the actual port. Right, that's going to be assigned dynamically, you know, by the infrastructure when we run on the remote server or right, the remote environment. So, so that port is actually available to us through an environment variable, right? And so, so what we're going to do is that we're going to check that environment variable, process that env dot port. That's where it's available. Now, if it's not available, right? If like locally, locally we don't have this environment variable port, right? So that's going to be null. So locally, that's not going to exist. So we're going to default to 4,000. Right? But remotely, when it does run on Net, on um, Heroku or uh, Render, that port is actually going to have a value, right? and it's not it's not going to use 4,000. Right? Instead, it'll use the this environment right on the remote environment. Okay, make sense. All right. Um, all right. So uh, let's, uh, let's continue. All right, so now, now that we have uh, these, the, the client and the server talking to one another, uh, let's, let's, take a, let's explore different ways of interacting, sending data back and forth from the client and server. And there are three basic ways, right, that we can send data from the client to the server. Even though we're sending data, it's, they're always referred to as requests. We're sending a request, right? And and then and then you know whatever we're sending to the server is 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 so that the server can fulfill that request. Okay. Um. So so there are three basic ways. One is to send data as part of the URL path, right? So for instance, we might say you know add the two and the five, right, in that path. And this would be to parse out uh, the values in the path, right, so that it can fulfill the request, request. Another way is to encode data at the end of the URL in what is called a query string, right? 
and the query string contains query parameters a and b with values to one, right so this one is not declaring parameters right or variables right it's just providing in the path in the position right those particular values right uh, which presumably are going to be mapped to some variables or constants a and b that we can then manipulate them and add um, here so we are incorporating as part of the query string with a question mark and then a e, you know uh, parameter equal value ampersand parameter equal value ampersand and so on and so forth right? and the most advanced one is to you know just send an entire object right and put it as a json object although you know you can also send it in different different formats right xml right and csv uh, comma separated values but the most common is and, you know especially since we are working with javascript is to send them encoded as json objects or right so so let's let's explore each one of these right as we go all right so first we'll explore sending data to the server you know just encoded in the in the path right with as uh, path parameters so let's put this, um, this path parameters in in the, on the server side right so on the server side uh, let's see let me put this here maybe yeah, let's put this back here so here, let's uh, under lab five, we'll create a new function in here, right? And um, let's copy that. Uh, so what this is doing is that the function right here is a reference to the express instance uh, that is going to allow us to declare two routes, right? So one of the routes, you know, starts with lab five. You know, all the routes for lab five start with lab five, right? Then slash add slash colon a colon b. So we've seen that before, right? Using colons, right? We've used it when we're declaring routes on the client side to declare parameters, right? In the client, the parameters were passed in, right? When we navigate it to the link, right? It would encode data in the path and then read those path parameters using uh, you know, use params, right? Uh, and then it would be parsed out the names and the values of the parameters from the URL. But here we're not on the on the on the browser, right? We're not in the user interface. Instead, we are on the server side, right? And so we are, but still, we are going to be parsing data that is going to be passed to us in the URL, right? And so we use the same syntax, saying that these are I, I want to extract. You know those parts in the URL. Uh, I want to name them, you know, the, by placeholder. Uh, and the way we retrieve it is through the request object. Remember, the first argument to this uh, function is a um, it, it represents the incoming request right from client applications. And the second object, right, is represents the response that we can generate to send back to the client. So from the request, right, this is, this is everything that's coming from the from the client, including this URL with the encoded data. So request params includes a you know a, a, a JSON object, right, that contains any parameters that were encoded URL with the name name and the values that go along with them, right. So this so it's extracting A and B, right, from the, that's when we gave them names, right? And the values are the actual values in those URLs. Uh, we parse them, right, all, all of these they are um, parsed out from the URL. These are all strings, right? So we're converting them into two integers, right? And then we're adding them to compute the sum. And then we send back the sum, converting into a string. Now it's important that we convert it into a string because Otherwise, the browser would in, interpret numbers, it would interpret them as status codes, right? That, you know, four, four, right? Or, uh, and so we don't want that. So instead we convert into a string to make sure that it doesn't interpret these as numbers, right? To just, you know, print out the result as a string. 
Uh, same thing for the subtract, right? We're subtracting, converting to in integers, right? And then converting the converting log to a uh, string, right? Uh, now, the assignment does ask you to, on your own, you know, just add two more routes, one for uh, multiplication, the other for division, right? Just, just so you practice. All right, so we created these path parameters. Now we need to load them into our app. All right, we need to import. Uh, actually, um, no, right? So yeah, we, we're importing in lab five. So lab five, and we're going to import, we say import path parameters, right? And then we're just gonna call path like this. There we go. Right. And so now I should be able to try it out. Right. So let's see if I go uh, here and I'd say uh, lab five and then add two and three. And it doesn't work. Wait, what? Uh, lab five. Let me see. Close, close this. Close this. Uh, let's see. Oh, it crashed. Waiting for the file to change. Something wrong with the server. Let's see. What did I do with the server? Uh, path parameter. Uh, let's see. Did it restart? Still. Uh, cannot find module. Blah, 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 blah. Path parameters. I oh, can't find it. Why can't it find it? Probably because it didn't add the .js. .js. Save that. Let's see. Is the okay? Now it's up and running. Yeah. Don't forget the .js express extension. Okay, refresh. There it is. Two plus three is indeed five. Okay. Um. Yeah. So the subtract should also work. So if you subtract two minus three is minus is minus one. Okay. Um. Uh, so then I think the uh, exercise asks you to interact with this little server, right, um, calculator by creating a tiny, tiny little user interface, right, so that you can, you know, maybe type a couple of values and then send one or the other. Uh, so for instance, in the, in the client side and the, and the user interface, also create a path parameters, right? Uh, so under lab five, we'll create a path parameter. So this will be the user interface side to our server side. Right, so so that they can interact. So this will be ex export default uh, path parameters, and I think did I get did I give you the code? I think I gave you the code. Oh yeah, so I ju I'm just going to copy it, and so I'm just going to paste this whole thing. Uh, so notice that any URLs, I'm always going to use the remote server. Right. And so this creates two input fields and a couple of buttons uh, and two hyperlinks. And, the, and one of the hyperlinks is going to call the add and the other one's going to call the subtract. Right. Uh, so let's uh, add this to uh, lab five. So this will be uh, path parameters uh, like that. So that if I go back, there they are. Right. So I can I have some, some values. We can call 34 plus 23, comes back with 57, or subtract 34 minus 23, 11, right? So again, uh, look at sending the request out to the server, the server response. Again, we're still navigating away from the user interface, right? Uh, we're leaving the React side. Uh, eventually, what we want to be able to do is um, you know, send this request, but don't leave the user interface, right? We don't know how to do that yet. You know, maybe send the request, uh, you know, through the back door, right? Uh, kind of like in, in the in the background, uh, and then you know, intercept the response and maybe display it here, right? Without leaving the uh, React application. So we'll learn that in a minute. Uh, so let's do a couple more. So query parameters, we like to be able to know for passing data to the server is to encode the data at the end of the URL with a query string, with a, with a question mark, right? Uh, so let's create that query parameters. So uh, let's see. 
a new file, query parameters. Uh, let's copy. So this does exactly the same thing, add, subtract, and whatnot. But but instead, right, it's going to find all this data at the end of the URL after the question mark. Right, you're going to have a equals something, b equals something, blah blah blah, whatever. Right. Um, so, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to pass in in the URL the operation, whether it's addition, subtraction, multiplication, whatever, plus parameters A and B. And then we have like a switch statement, right? If the operation is add, we add them. If it's subtract, we subtract them and whatnot, right? And then we just respond with the results, convert it into a string, right? Um, so, so yeah, so let's uh, now on the user interface in the um, uh, we, we need to add this to our lab five. So in here, we'll import the query parameters, right? And then we will pass an instance to app. So now it should work, right? I think this might work. Let's see, does this work? I uh, guess not. <laughs> uh, oh, A5, no, it's supposed to be lab five. Let me fix that. So it's supposed to be, copy that, paste, apply. And copy that, paste, apply, Let's see. There it is, right? So that's the server, it comes back with 57, uh, and this goes out, right, and it's 11. So notice that it's encoding the URL, the data, and the actual question mark. After that, it's, and this, this whole thing is called a query string, everything after the question mark, right? And it's just basically parameter equal value, ampersand, parameter equal value, ampersand. So it's a, Ampersand delimited name value pair, right? Uh, now, on the client side, we can create a small little user interface that, again, creates an input field, creates all that, right? So let's uh, do that. And it's going to be very similar to the path parameter that we have so far. So I'm actually going to copy it. All right, so I'm going to copy this path parameter so that um, path parameter, because I have the input fields and the state variables already ready to go. I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to rename it to, uh, what is it? Query parameters, query parameters, like that. Um, and uh, I'm going to call this also query parameters, query parameters. Uh, and, and then here's the code. So this, this is what goes in the return. Like that, that should still work. Um, so it's the same thing, right? Uh, same same um, state variables, A and B, right? Same thing for the input fields, that's the same. Now, the difference is that from the path parameters, right, the URLs encoded the data, right, as part of the path, the URL. Whereas in the query parameters, they're being encoded, right, in a question mark at the end, see that A and B, right? Um, so, so yeah, so here we should be able to bring in the Query parameters, there they are, right? And this should work the same. Uh, I might've not uh, styled them. I might've not given the class as button primary and this one button danger, right? And, and that they still work, right? The URLs, okay? All right. So on your own, create addition, subtraction, right? Okay, so what about you know, objects, entire objects? Uh, so, so these objects could exist on the server and, uh, you know, and, the, and the server would, uh, would maintain the state of, the, of that object on the server as long as the server is running. You know, just like we can declare objects you know, arrays and data structures on the use in the user interface, the server can also declare its own variables, right? And arrays and data structures. The difference is on the client, right? Any modifications to those state variables, they go away when we refresh. And it's a very common thing you know, to refresh, right? Um, whereas in the server, the, the those variables would live on as long as the server is running. Uh, which is very common that the server is running 24-7. It's always running, right? So the state will have a much longer lifespan, right, on the server than on the client, right? So let's, uh, let's create a little um, example here working with objects on the server side. 
right? And let's uh, copy the content. So here we're comparing a, a constant right, called assignments. So it's one single object, right? It has a, an ID for that assignment, the title, the description. So, and, and then here, a, a, we, we've created here a route that makes that data available at this URL. Right, so localhost 4000, lat5 slash assignment, it'll respond back a JSON object, formatted as JSON of the assigned object. Um, so notice that we've been set using send up to this point, uh, which is fine for simple primitive data types. But if you know that you know, your data needs to be formatted as JSON, it's better to use .json instead of .send. Right? Uh, so let's bring that in into our lab five, our working with uh, objects. So um, working with objects, right? And app.js app, right? So, so now I should be able to, you know, go here and, and say, um, assignment and there it is right the server response right with the assignment with the title description and whatnot but let's create a little user interface for this right so from the uh from user interface right we could create just a little hyperlink uh, that is going to just you know go and fetch the uh, assignment from the user from the server right so let's uh create this on the client, we'll create a little component, right? That is going to retrieve that one JSON, uh, JSON object. And from the lab five, let's import that, you know, working with objects. Click on that, it goes and fetches the assignment. Very good. Um, all right, anyway, uh, work through these exercises. We can change the properties of objects. We can manipulate them. We can modify them, right? Um, now on your own, it's asked you to create an object of, uh, of your own, right? An object called module object that has uh, the name of the module, an ID, a description, the course. So work on that on your own, right? Okay, so now let's work on arrays, right? Let's um. Let's actually take a short break. Break, and uh, we'll come back. And when we come back, we'll uh, take a look at uh, how to deal with you know, something a little more challenging, right? Working with uh, remote arrays. Okay. Right back anywhere. All right, uh, we've seen how we can work with uh, objects that are being hosted by remote servers, right? So we saw an example of an assignments object, right? That, that we can uh, retrieve and the exercises walk you through being able to manipulate it, you know, change properties, retrieve a particular property, things like that. And uh, let's consider now something a little more interesting, uh, being able to work with arrays, right? So a, you know, a little more complex data structures. And so, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll create a small little to-do list example where we're gonna be able to add a new or delete a to-do or modify, manipulate a particular item in that, in that to-do, right? All this is being hosted by the server, right? I'm gonna create a collection of routes that are going to allow us to manipulate this data that lives in a remote server, but from within the user interface, right? Uh, now the collection of all these routes, right, that allow you to create, read, update, delete data structures, you know, that are hosted in a remote server, those are generally gener uh, referred to as uh, web APIs, right? An API, an application programming interface, right, that allows us to uh, manipulate data remotely, right, through a web interface, right? And so, yeah, so let's create a, a little array example here, right? So let's uh, create um, under here uh, arrays, working with arrays, and let's copy this. So we have uh, several to-dos here, uh, and um, we have a, a route here that goes to 
Okay, you have all the to dos, right? all the uh, the entire set of to dos. Okay, so we'll uh, import this in lab five. So. <laughs> Port. <laughs> right. And we'll pass in an instance of app. So now that's there, I, we should be able to just um, uh, go to lab five to do's and retrieve all the to do's from our. Uh, oops, no. <laughs> just to do. There it is. So it's retrieving the four to do items with unique identifiers. Uh, title and whether it's completed or not. Okay. Um, so, but you know, we can now go back to the user interface and add a little, uh, maybe a hyperlink that would allow us to retrieve the data right from the React web app. Right. So let's uh, let's take a look at that. Um, so yeah. So from the from the user interface, we can also create a component of the same name. Right, so let's see what the um there it is and let's copy uh, the code and what it's doing here is basically um just going out to the remote server with the hyperlink the same thing that we did uh, before by typing the url this is doing it uh, from within the user interface with the href and the api right remote server lat 5 uh, to do this and then we include it in our lab five, right? So working with arrays that so that uh, if we go here and uh, we see lab five, um, let's go back. There it's working with arrays. We click on get to do's and we get the to do's. Yes. All right. So let's uh, let's focus now on implementing a couple of CRUD operations. You know, creating the thing you saw reading right being able to retrieve or read data from a remote server uh, but um, um, uh, another very common operation is that we want to retrieve a specific item right from the from the right and usually we want to do it by providing a primary key right uh, so so let's uh, add to working with a race let's uh, add this new route Right, so here, let's add the route. So this one, if you don't, this route here, if you don't provide the any identifier, then typically the understanding is that you are asking for all the instances of the data structure. Whereas if you, you know, in addition, you provide a primary key, then the understanding uh, is that you're asking for a specific instance of that uh, object in one of that data structure, right? That collection. So here we are extracting the ID, uh, finding that specific item, right, in the URL, in the array, right, and then just responding with that single object, right? So, so this one now, if I if I say, you know, slash three, right, it responds with that one item, right? Uh, so from a user's user interface's point of view. What we could do is um, in the same working with arrays user interface, we can add a use state variable right uh, here in uh, working with arrays, create a state variable uh, that is going to, oops, sorry, in here, that, uh, that is going to allow us to edit the ID of the to-do item that we want, right? So let's, uh, let's add that state variable right here like that. Uh, and then maybe let's add a um, an input field where we can type the ID of the to do that we want to retrieve, right? So, so let's see. So under here, that's so we can retrieve an item by its primary key. So this is if it's ID one, right? Then the URL is going to provide the ID as part of the URL. So go back to the get to do. There it is, one, right? But if I say, uh, if I type two, then it would get the item two. Yes, right? Very rudimentary, but it works, right? Um, so, what about if um, 
want to retrieve maybe a collection of to-dos that meet a particular criteria, right? Right now, I can retrieve an individual ID by their primary key, but say I want to retrieve them by other properties, right? Because we have the to-dos have the property primary key, but they have other properties, right? We, we know how to now retrieve an individual uh, item by their primary key. But what about, you know, I want to filter by completed. I want to know which, you know, retrieve for me all the items, all the to-dos that were completed, right? Um, so for that, typically we don't use uh, the, the path. We don't encode that information in the path of how do we want to filter something. It's that really the query string. The query string is a perfect place to put in your know, parameters that or for a criteria by which we want to filter the data out, right? Uh, so in this example, um, what we're gonna do is that we're going to refactor this one, right? So that by default, right, if you don't provide any query string, we just give you all the, all the to-dos. But if you do provide a query string, like this one, like that, right? So let's, so let's add it here. So it's gonna take the query string and it's gonna extract a completed, um, so it can pass in completed true, completed false as a filter, right? And then, so if it's if it's not defined, right? Um, all right, so, may, so I'm sorry, if it's not undefined, meaning we do pass in the property completed, uh, it, this, this value completed is gonna be a string. Right, but we need to convert it into a Boolean, right? So to convert it to a Boolean, we're gonna say complete it. If it's equal to the string true, right? Uh, then this will be either true or false. So if it's true, this is gonna be true. If this is something other than true, this will be false, right? And then and then we can filter out the completed to-dos by saying, you know, to-dos filter, the ones that are equal, the flag is equal to the Boolean flag. And then we just return the to-dos and then we return, we don't continue. Otherwise we, we, would, we would be sending two responses, right? One with the completed to-dos and then again with the to-dos and we actually would get an error in the server, right? Because you can't send two responses. This can only be one response, right? So this one returns right away, right? Because we're done, these are the completed to-dos. If, now, if we don't pass in the completed flag, this would be undefined. So this would not execute, right? We would just continue and just respond with all the to-dos, right? Um, so, so yeah, so we can, we can uh, save that, save it. So now, for instance, if I say, you know, to -dos, there's all of them. And then I can say now a query string, say complete it uh, equal true. So now it returns the only two to do's that were completed, right? Or I can say false, right? It would return the ones that are false. Okay. So again, uh, the, the, um, the primary key, right? Uh, is a, usually you encode it as part of the path, right? That's the standard, right? And that returns that unique identifier. But if you want to filter, right, you use the query string, right? Where would you return now a, an array of objects, right, that meet the criteria, right? Uh, so for instance, if you want to filter out users, right, if you're looking for a particular employee, for instance, you would provide the employee ID, right? But if you're looking for employees that are in a particular department, right, then you would use a query string, you know, department equal, you know, engineering or something, right? And then you would retrieve uh, those in engineering employees. Um, all right, so uh, let's, uh, let's continue. Uh, yeah, so that's the user interface to do that. You know, you can do that on your own. Uh, creating new data in the server, uh, again, here is another example, create, uh, this will create a new instance of the object, right? And then push it into the array, right? And then it will respond with all, all the entire array, including the new to-do. Um, then deleting on the server, uh, we, would, we would provide the ID of the object that we want to remove uh, and some some indicator that that's what we want to do, delete, right? And then, and then we would, uh, you know, filter out that element from the, uh, from the array, okay? 
Um, all right, so work on these, work on these. Uh, um, I do want to focus more on something more advanced on you know how to how to interact with the server, but without leaving the user interface. Right now, all our interactions, right, all our interactions um, have been by you know navigating away from the user interface and and displaying the response from the server, right? This one or adding, notice that we're navigating away from the user, user interface. We're no longer, notice that this is running on localhost 3000. And then we're no longer in 3000, see that? Right, we are interacting, we're no longer running, executing any JavaScript in the user interface, right? Right, if I come back, now we're back in the user interface. Well. We want to be able to interact with the server, but without ever leaving the, the user interface, right? So what we're going to do is that we're going to use a technique called uh, asynchronous communication, right? That uh, uses a technology called Ajax, right? Uh, that it can send these requests asynchronously behind the scenes, right? Um, in a separate process, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, without leaving the user interface, all right? Uh, and it's gonna be able to intercept the response from the server and then update the user interface accordingly, all right? So let's do that. Right, so we're gonna be using a, te a technology called AJAX, which me is, uh, stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, right? And now XML, um, you know, this technology was developed when JSON was not the leading format right for exchanging data uh, on the web right it was still xml was still very very popular as the format right of data exchange back and forth between client and servers right uh, i was this was throughout the 2000s right very very popular <laughs> uh, but uh, ever since you know as the, you know 23 years later 24 years later uh, JSON has overtaken XML as the uh, as the main way of formatting data uh, exchange between clients and servers, but the name stuck, right? So it's still AJAX XML, A, and but the data that we're going to be sending back and forth is going to be formatted as JSON. So, so what what we need to do is uh, we need to be able to do this communication here, right? Uh, you know, instead of instead of actually navigating to the server like we're doing here. Uh, we need to be able to do that programmatically behind the scenes, okay? Let me turn this light. Maybe it's better now. Uh, so we're gonna, need, we're gonna need a uh, library to be able to do this, right? To be able to send these, these requests out to the server without leaving the client, right? So we're gonna do a, uh, use a library that implements the Ajax technology, right? Axios is a library that allows you to do this, right? So on the, in the, so on the browser side, uh, we're going to uh, install Axios, right? Um, and, um, and then here we're going to um, create a, uh, a, a, a user interface that is going to use the Axios library, right? Uh, so that instead of using a hyperlink, there's not we're not going to use hyperlinks anymore, right? So we're not going to click on a hyperlink and then navigate to the server. Right? Instead, this is going to behind the scenes is going to send a GET request out to the server. Right? We'll give it the URL, right? But it's not going to leave the the, the user interface. And then we're gonna be able to wait for the response to come back from the server, right? And then we can manipulate this, the, the, the data that came back from the server from within the user interface, right? So let's do that. Let's uh, create here a little HTTP client, right? Uh, and um, so, uh, and we'll do that uh, right here. Uh, we'll have to restart the server, uh, the client. And we'll create our own here, uh, HTTP client. There you go. And let's paste that in. Like that. Okay. 
Uh, so let's uh, let's go over this uh, for a second. All right. Let's also import this in our lab five. So this is our HTTP client. So there it is. It's this one right here, right? We have a um, a button that is going to simply go out to the the server. It's the lab five welcome, right? It's the uh, the one where we did um we we did the uh, lab five welcome here welcome. Uh, oops. Oh, not welcome. Or oh, do we have hello? What do we have? Oh, do we have the server running? <laughs> yeah, it is running. Uh, why do we not have hello? Interesting. Uh, app hello is hello. Is the server running? Oh, right. No, lab five. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. So this is um, uh, hello. There it is, right? And we had lab five, like that. Um, and um, okay, I don't, I don't have a hello on lab five. I don't have a, I have it on just lab five, which is fine, right? The assignment asks you to do it in, you know, lab five. Welcome, right? And so, so I'll just change mine a little bit so that it just goes to lab five, just like that. Lab five. Your, yours will have to match uh, the assignment. So yeah, so it wants to you know, notice it has a button, right? So if I if I press that button, right, it it's uh it's going to call fetch welcome on click, uh, and then it's going to do an Axios, going to go out to that lap five, this right here, this lap five, and I want to be able to grab that, that response that's coming from the server. There it is. You see that lap five? That's what the response is coming from that server. There's there's the request going out, right? Uh, and there's the response coming back. I want to be able to grab that from the user interface, right? And then just display it. Got the response. I'm going to set the state variable right here, right? The response. And then I'm going to display it in the user interface without leaving the user interface. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's try it out. Let's uh, actually look at the, the communication back and forth, right? Let's put this uh, at the bottom. Like that. All right, and let me uh, clear this. Uh, we can see the network when we look at the console, All right? And let's try it out. Fetch. Okay. Uh, so I got we got a really ugly error message, and it's all uh, part of the lab, <laughs> right? Uh, you should have gotten this error message like this, something like that, right? And so it's telling us that something went wrong, right? And um, the error says that we have an, an access, we try to access, we try to access lap five, you know, localhost 4000 lap five, but from localhost 3000, right? And as far as the browser is concerned, this is a violation of the course policy, right? Course stands for cross origin resource sharing, right? Uh, so what happens is that this URL, this uh, URL, as far as the browser is concerned, this URL is different than this URL, right? The, the only difference is the port. But as far as the browser is concerned, that is different enough to merit okay, a violation of the course policy, which says that um, a JavaScript file that was downloaded from one domain right, can only talk to the domain it was downloaded from. It cannot talk to anyone other, right? Um, so a, if you download a JavaScript file, right, and it's running on a browser, it's only allowed to make a network communication back to the server that it was downloaded from. In, in our case, our browser is downloading its JavaScript files from localhost 3000, right? That's where we're, we're hosting our web app, right? Uh, so it's running on a browser, but now we're asking it to communicate with somebody in port 4000. Right? That's what this uh, what um, this uh, remote server is at port 4000. And so, so as far as the browser is concerned, that's a violation. You can't, do that. you can't have one JavaScript, you know, downloaded from one domain talking to someone else in another domain. Right? You need to ask for permission. 
right? You haven't asked for permission. Um, so let's configure. Now, since we own both sides, we own the browser, right? The client, the React web app, and we also own the server, we can configure this any which way we want, right? So we're going to configure the server, right? To say, hey, you're going to get a request from this other dude, right? You know, running at four, 3,000. That's fine, right? He's my friend, right? We're, we're good. And so, so we're going, we're going to uh, tell the server, just actually just accept requests from anyone, right? Don't, don't bother, right? So, so the, the way it's going to work is that the server, the browser is going to go out to the server and going to say, hey, server, we've got this, you know, JavaScript that was downloaded from a different domain and wants to talk to it. Is it okay? And the server, we're going to configure it to say, yeah, it's okay, right? I'm going to just open open wide my course policy, right? I'm good. Right, so let's do that. So let's go back to the server, right? And on the server, uh, we're going to um, stop the server. We'll stop the server. And we're going to npm install the course library. So the course library is going to allow us to configure the course policy on the server. Let's go back to the server. And in app.js, we're going to import course, right? And, and this, net, this uh, the way we do it, we, we, the way we configure is uh, just like there's an app.get, right? That we say we're expecting a get request from, from the client. There's also app.use. App.use says that, um, you know, do the following for all requests, not, not only get, right? But uh, you know, even if it's a post, a put, a delete, uh, whatever, right? Always do this, always do that. that. So course, right, is a, is a function, right? And we're creating an instance of that, of that uh, policy. And here in the parentheses, you can configure the policy. You can say, hey, I want requests only from this IP address, right? From this port, right? And only if they're authentic authenticated and you know if they have this role. And you can you can configure very specific policy of how you know who do you want it to talk to you, right? Now if you don't provide any arguments, you're just opening up for anybody. Right? We're saying there is no policy, right? I'm accepting requests from everybody, right? And that's what we're going to do for now, right? So we'll revisit this a little later, right? We'll, we'll tighten it up a little bit and say, well, actually not from everybody, right? Only from certain URLs, right? Only from certain people that are logged in or not, right? But for now, let's open it up uh, and re let's restart the server. Let's restart the server. And so now if we go back here to the user interface and we try it again, right, let's reload. Right? And um, and we do the uh, fetch welcome. Notice that now, indeed, the request went out, came back. We can see the network here. Notice that the network, we can see, uh, we can see, let's clear this out. Let's do it again. Let's refresh, clear out. Uh, and so if we click on this, notice that, there it is. See that, there's a request went out, the header, See, went out localhost 4000 lap 5. That's what went out to the server. The server, we can see the response as welcome to lap 5. We grabbed it. There it is. Here's the response, the raw response that came back from the, from the server. Uh, and, um, and, and, and the actual data that the server comes back with is in the response.data. And we're using it to set it, set here the local uh, state variable and display the response from the server. Does that make sense? Now, it's a, it's very common that data, so he, here the data is being fetched on requests, right? On, on users initiating, right, the event by clicking this button, right? So I went, I click on the button and then it went to fetch. But actually it's, it's, uh, it's very common that these requests occur when the when the component first loads without the user taking any 
uh, action, right? Uh, so 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 it's, let's, let's look at that, right? So we want to be able to fetch the data, but not because I clicked on anything or did anything. I just want to go and fetch it right when I load. For instance, when you go to uh, you know Facebook or or X or any or any application, typically, right? You see data. Well, what happens is that when you when you first go to those pages, on load, right, the JavaScript or React or whatever, right, will initiate a request from the server, fetch data, right, and then display it from the user without the user taking any action, right? So let's, how do we do that? So to do that, uh, we are, um, uh, we're gonna create another, um, actually I have a exercise here. Uh, we are going to use a, um, uh, we're going we're going to go use a, 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 a the a, what's called a use effect right and use effect right, this one right here uh, is going to allow us to invoke code right on demand right when when the when the component first loads right. So let's um let's copy here a welcome on click and this will be welcome on load right so when you first load okay so we're going to be two state variables and we're going to have two responses here right we're going to have another response and this, is this uh, on load right and this is going to display on load here on load all right and we want to populate this when the component first loads. Uh, so we're gonna copy this code and exactly the same thing is gonna be fetch welcome on load. It's gonna do the same exact query and it's gonna populate this other uh, state variable. And we're gonna run this function when we first navigate, right? Uh, unfortunately, we can't just um, call it like this, right? Uh, it will do the query, it will do the query, but uh, because it's a state change, because it's a state change, it will not change it, right? So, so instead, what we need to do is that we need to wrap this. We're going to wrap this inside a a um, uh, a use, use effect, sorry, a use effect that is going to call this, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> I can't, use effect, use effect, there it is, there we go. I was gonna call fetch welcome on load, right? Uh, and, and there it is, right, we just saw it. All right, so let me, let me uh, clear this. And notice I'm gonna refresh the screen, refresh the screen. And notice that just by refreshing the screen, notice that the lab five request went out. See that? The lab five request went out without me clicking anything, just because it, you know, it refreshed, the request went out and it populated my onload here. Right now this one would only this, uh, populate if I deliberately click on this function, it will make another request, right? And and fetch the data again, right? And then populate this one over here. Everybody good? Yeah, so I just wanted to you know, illustrate that uh, you can either initiate the request by clicking or when you first load, right? Um, for instance, when we're gonna go fetch dashboard, all the courses from the server, it's going to be when we navigate to the dashboard, right, we need to initiate right, the fetching of the courses from the server so that we can populate all those courses in the user interface, right? Without me clicking, you know, fetch the courses or anything, right? Um, now, also, it's a, notice that here we are doing all the communication from within the component, right? From within the component, we are initiating all the network communication, usually considered to be a bad practice, right? To do the communication right from within the component. Instead, it's more common to, um, modularize this, right, and create a separate file that has all communication code in the file, 
right? Instead of doing it from within, from within the component. So now those files typically are referred to as either service files or client files, right? So I'm gonna use a client and call it client. Let's create a file here called client, client, TS. So this is not a component that renders. This only has utility functions for talking to the server and they all live here instead of living in the components, right? So in particular, um, this is one of the communications that we wanna do, that one right there, right? So I um, call you it know, con, you know, export, a, uh, const, you know, fetch, uh, welcome message or something. Welcome message, and it's gonna be right like that. That's gonna be the, the code, um, and I'm gonna return the data like that. And I'm gonna import Axios, there we go. And I need remote server, uh, that's um, const remote server, and that's a process, so process, EMV, there we go, right? Okay, so now that this has been declared here, I can go back uh, and here import the whole, the whole code. You can say import all of it as client from the, from the local client file, there we go. And so here, instead of, instead of making this communication, I can now use the client. I can say, um, I can go and say, you know, client dot fetch the welcome message, uh, await. Uh, and this would be the message already, right? Because I already, I'm returning the data. So this would be the message, a welcome message, right? And I would just put this in there like that, right? Uh, and same thing, I would do the same thing here, right? And this would be the welcome message like that, okay? And this should work just the same. Let's see, um, if I refresh, notice that again, it's going out, fetching the data, right? And displaying it. Uh, and if I click, right, it's going out, right? And fetching the data and displaying it. Right, so it works exactly the same way, right? Uh, but it's a little better designed. Right? Notice that now the, the, the user interface, you know, has no notion that this is going, you know, I'm going out to the server to fetch any of this data. You know, I'm, I'm just using these uh, client files, right? Um, also notice the syntax here of the async and await, right? So these are two new keywords, right, that um, make clear that we are establishing, you know, asynchronous communication with the server, right? That, um, that we are using, excuse me, Axios, right, to establish an AJAX uh, communication, asynchronous communication with a server uh, that um, uh, doesn't block the JavaScript um, thread, right? The brow browsers have only one single JavaScript thread uh, and uh, process, and then we don't want to block it waiting for the server, right, to come back with a response. So what really happens is that the the um, the JavaScript thread says, well, you know, I can't, I can't have, I don't have multi-threading, right? And, but the browser does. The browser knows how to do multi-threading. So basically, the the, the JavaScript is asking the browser to these multi-threading capabilities go and fetch this request for JavaScript, uh, and and then. So JavaScript doesn't have to block. JavaScript can continue, you know, animating stuff or showing or streaming or whatever, right? As uh, while the browser is going to fetch this request. Now, when the cert, when the browser comes back, it notifies JavaScript, and and, and, and so the browser, the the, server, the the JavaScript is oh, thank you, right? And it continues. So so that is all written behind this keyword of async uh, and await. Right. Um, all right, so those were some examples. Let's uh, do some more. Um, so, so for instance, uh, yeah, we did a load. Uh, right, so the, the assign, all, all, the, all the examples that we did earlier of retrieving the assignment, retrieving the to-dos, 
right? All that can be rewritten, right? In a, in a way that uses this new, new approach, right? Of using asynchronous communication. So I'm gonna, I'm going to um, uh, demonstrate with the array. So let's look at the array, right? So, so let's uh, let's create on in the on the on the client side. Let's let's talk to the uh, to the server. Right? Let's fetch the to dos. Let's do all that. But instead of managing the server and showing the the response of the array on the server, let's go and intercept that request, right? And display the user in the user interface, right? So let's do it. So in the client, let's add the following, right? So in the client code here. Right. So this is a to-do API. API meaning I'm gonna there's gonna be several operations that are gonna allow us to interact with the to-dos, right? So it's a it's an API, it's a collection of interfaces, right? So uh, to retrieve the to-dos, it's at lap five to-dos, right? And this is fetch to do, it's gonna go out at the to-dos API and it's gonna respond with the array here. And then so now on the on the, on the on the user interface side, right, let's create a component that asynchronously fetches this and displays the to-dos right, uh, in the, you know, as an array of to-dos, right? So let's uh, do that. Uh, let's create a component here. So this is working with arrays asynchronous. So we have the working with arrays that was not asynchronous. This one is asynchronous, right? Um, Let's uh, copy that and let's fetch it, let's paste it in here and let's look at how, how it works. And we can load it in our, let's see. It's not here, it's not here. So let me, let me load it in the lap five here. This is working with arrays, working with arrays asynchronously. There we go. And there it is, right? So let's let me show you how it works, right? So what's happening here is that um, we have a, a state variable that's going to hold the to dos. Uh, we have the uh, the fetch the to dos, which is using client fetch to dos. What is going to send a get request for all the to dos, right? It's going to respond the array of to dos. Right? What comes back from the server is the array of to dos. Uh, and then we set the state variable to do's. And we do the fetch on load. On load, we call fetch to do's. Now the arrays of to do's now can be treated like any other uh, data structure, right? Uh, array data structure. I'm just going to map over it, right? We have a line item that displays for each one of the to do's. Uh, the ID of the to do, right? We, we have a checkbox that renders as checked or unchecked based on whether the to do was completed or not, right? And then the title, right? And the title um, is um, style here that uh, decorates it with a line through uh, if it's done or no decoration if it's not done, right? So that's that's how I achieve that, right? Uh, and you can see the communication from the server to the server. We can inspect and look at the network, right? We can refresh and we can see that we are fetching the to dos. There it is, right? Which we built earlier, right? And it's responding the same, you know, JSON array of to dos that we had earlier, right? So it's this URL, right? It's this URL of returning arrays. But instead of navigating like we did earlier, now we are intercepting the, the response here, right? And then we're using it to display it in a user interface, right? Without navigating away of, from, of the, from the user interface, right? Much, much smoother, right? Um, we can delete uh, data. Uh, now, the, the way it was implemented, the delete was implemented in the prior exercises was a, um, an iffy way of deleting. Uh, uh, that's not how you would normally do it. Instead, what you would do Right, is that um, you know? Th yeah, this was the old implementation, right? You have um, a, you have the to do ID, and the and the slash delete, right? Um, so so we're not going to do that. We're not going to 
do that. Uh, this asks you to implement it so that uh, you you practice the way not to do it, right? And it asks you to add a trash can. Now, the um, the, the 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 correct way of doing it, the correct way of doing it is, <clears throat> excuse me, clean data from a server with HTTP delete. The correct way of doing it is to use the method, the delete method, right? Instead of the dot get method and add a slash delete at the end, right? So let me show you. Uh, so so here's the 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 incorrect way of doing it. And this is the correct way of doing it. So let's copy that. Uh, so let's go to the server, right? And um, in um, working with arrays here, working with arrays, uh, let's uh, paste this in here. Notice that all examples up to this point are all app.gets everywhere, app.get, right? Well, the server can respond to more different requests. Right, not just get requests. Right, uh, and in particular, they can uh, respond to delete type of requests. Right, and that is the appropriate type. You know, especially if you are removing stuff from a data structure. Right, a get is uh, for retrieving data, not for deleting data. For deleting data, you should use app .get. Right? and and so we are specifying the ID of the item that we're removing, right? And uh, we're extracting it from here, and then we're just you know, finding that item, and then we're splicing it out from the array, right? And then and then we respond with this test, and yeah, we were able to delete. Obviously, um, if, if you were trying to delete a, an item that is not in the collection, then we should respond with an error message. And the assignment asks you to do that, you know, to handle error messages a little later. But I'm, I'm optimistic that you're sending us an ID of an item that indeed exists in the array, and I'm going to be able to splice it out. Right? And I just respond with a, with a thumbs up. Okay, I'm being optimistic. Um, so now on the client side, right, in the client.ts, this is the correct implementation. So first, I'm going to ask the old way using get, uh, but then it asks you to rewrite it using uh, the correct way. The instead of the axios.get, we're going to use axios.delete, which is the correct way of doing this. Right. So let's uh, copy this. And so on the class, right? Let's uh, post it in here. Delete. And then on the client, we're going to add a handler for a click. A, a um, um, we're going to add a an x to delete a uh, to do which is going to invoke this function, which is going to send the request to the server, delete, right? Uh, and so, um, so yeah, so on the, on the user interface, uh, we're going to uh, paste that handler here, right? And then we're going to um, import a, um, uh, an icon, X icon, a delete icon, and then we're going to add the icon to each one of the items in the line items that we are deleting. Uh, so here, I guess it would be, let me add it here maybe. Let's see. There it is. There's the X, right? Uh, so now the what what the X is going to do is it's going to call delete to do, right? So delete to do um, is um, going to uh, tell the client to send a delete message, access.delete, and it's going to respond um, by, so so notice that I'm getting a, a success 200 from the server. Uh, I, I'm not getting the new array that that contains now only the not deleted, right? Meaning, you know, all the arrays minus the one that I deleted. Instead, what I'm doing here, because I was successful, I'm assuming, I'm understanding that the server was able to delete it. So what I'll do, because I have a copy of that data in my client, right? In the browser, in the browser, I have the same array that the server has. I have a copy of it, right? So now we have to just synchronize, right? If the server says that they were able to delete it, you know, give me a thumbs up and says, oh, okay, then, uh, 
I'll delete it too from the client, right? It says, okay, well, I'll, let me find the to-do. I'll filter out. The server was able to filter from that side. I'm going to filter from my side, right? And I'm going to reset the to-do so that it doesn't contain that to-do that it just deleted, right? Again, not if you have an error, right? Not if I have an error message, then I won't do that. The, the, the server would say, we have to respond and say, no, I wasn't able to delete it. And the client would say, oh, okay, then I won't delete it from mine either, right? So again, trying to maintain synchronicity between the, the data on the server and the data on the client, right? So let's try it out. Um, so if I actually, no, let's look at the inspect and see the network communication here, network. And let's uh, clear that out. And so if we delete number three here, let's click it. Right? Notice that it's been removed. The server node has responded, right? That uh, I sent out the delete to delete number three and the response was an okay, 200. Yeah, very good. Um, so notice that there are two requests going out to the server, right? The first one is the URL that went out, okay? This is the browser asking for permission, right? Uh, asking, hey, um, my JavaScript here in my browser do this. Is it okay? Right? And so it's asking basically for my options. What are my options? Right? Uh, is this allowed? And the server, we've configured it to allow everything for anybody from any connection. Right? So the server, by its first responding with a, yep, your options are everything. You can send me a get, you can send me a put, you can send me a delete, you can send me a post, I'm good. I don't care, you <laughs> send me whatever you want, right? So because the browser says, oh, okay, uh, then he's good, right? So I'm gonna send this delete, right? And so this is the, this is called the pre-flight request, right? It's asking for permission, what are the options from the server? And then the browser just follows up saying, okay, well, I'm good. I'm gonna send the delete. I'm gonna I'm gonna let it pass through, you know, to the server. But I also notice that the if I refresh, right, it's gonna go fetch scan. Uh, oh, this time around, that to do that I de de deleted, notice that it, it is permanent, it's gone, right? <coughs> if we would be using just a state variable. Right on the client, if that is the only thing that we would be doing, right, the change, the modification of the array would not survive the refresh. Yeah, it is surviving because the state variable is really is happening on the server. The array lives on the server, which is asking for the latest version of that, which no longer contains the one we've removed. Right, not until we restart the server. If we restart the server then yes, right? Everything resets to the initial state of the server, which is fine for now, right? Not until we get to the database to be able to make changes completely permanent, right? And that's the topic uh, for the next module, right? Uh, so anyway, um, you know, work through the exercises, right? Through um, deleting, updating, creating, you know, learning how to manipulate data structures, right, from uh, within the user interface, right, that you're manipulating data that lives on the remote server. You know, being able to update, um, so yeah, how to handle errors, okay? Anyway, uh, practice that. Uh, we'll come back uh, in the next lecture. Uh, we're gonna take, you know, all those skills and you know, apply them to refactoring our canvas, right? And canvas, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna move all the data from the client, we're gonna move it out, uh, over to the server.